As the year 1943 opens, for in battle Germany, no end of the war is in prospect. Germany's power on land is such that any early challenge is inconceivable. Nonetheless, the augurs are not good. All eyes are on the deepening nightmare of the Eastern Front and on one great zone of conflict, Stalingrad. The very name has become an obsession with Hitler, who has diverted large forces to the capture and defense of this Eastern city. Now, a whole German army is cut off in Fortress Stalingrad assailed by 70 Soviet divisions. A German relief offensive is beaten back. An airlift fails. The Red Army, in ever-increasing strength, attacks and harries unceasingly. The 6th Tank Army is left broken and shattered on the banks of the Volga. Further resistance is impossible. Von Paulus, newly created a field marshal, surrenders. His 100,000 surviving soldiers pass into captivity. Hitler has lost an entire army. In Berlin, he inaugurates four days of national mourning. It was in this same Berliner Platz four years previously that Hitler had embarked on the trail to glory. On a parade to mark his 50th birthday, there had passed in review before him the gleaming cohorts of Germany's magnificent new army. It was a sight to intimidate and overawe the world. It was true that most of the tanks were small and lightly armed, and that many were driven past twice in order to create an impression of greater numbers. Yet, they had amply served Hitler's grand purpose, which was to make a chilling and spectacular assertion of Germany's reborn military might. In the campaigns that had followed soon after that spring parade of 1939, neither the men nor their machines had failed Hitler. Repeatedly, his armies struck down all before them. In Poland, in Western Europe, in Africa, and deep inside the Soviet Union. The German soldier became accustomed to fighting against heavy numerical odds, and accustomed too to invariable victory. The comparatively few armored and mechanized units represented the only truly modern component of the German army, and were the key to much of its extraordinary success. The military of many countries were familiar with the wireless, the tank, and the warplane. But only in Germany were these elements so effectively combined to form flexible, fully integrated fighting units of exceptional striking power. Hitler's generals had rewritten the rule book of battle. In Poland, it took less than a month to dispose of an army which, though large, was poorly equipped and organized along rigidly traditional lines. In France, the Germans had challenged the largest and most modern army in Europe. But many of the French troops were undertrained. Morale was often low. And above all, the bulk of their officer class held to an outlook and methods little changed from the previous war. Like their French colleagues, the British commanders could think neither so fast nor as well as their German counterparts. And in the ensuing blitzkrieg or lightning war, the Allied forces were routed utterly. Even this achievement was eclipsed in turn by the early victories in the war against Stalin's Soviet Union, which Hitler invaded in June 1941. 
spearheaded by the tank formations, the German armies swept eastwards. In huge encirclements, thousands of Soviet tanks were destroyed and hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops killed or captured. For a while, it seemed that Hitler was bidding fair to succeed where even Napoleon had failed, the conquest of the vast Eastern power. The tank became established as the most potent symbol of German invincibility. In reality, the remarkable string of German successes was due less to superiority of military technology than to the excellence of German methods and training, to the imagination, adaptability, and initiative fostered in officers and men alike. This new way of waging war came as a terrible shock to Germany's opponents, forcing on them a radical rethink of prevailing military philosophy. Yet, however slowly, the lessons were learned, and in time, the answer to Blitzkrieg would be found. The fighting in the desert began with Italy's entry into the war in 1940. The British forces stationed in Egypt and Sudan confronted much larger Italian forces on two adjoining fronts. But the British did enjoy certain advantages. Their lumbering main battle tank, the Matilda, so-called because of its fancied resemblance to a popular cartoon duck of the period, was superior to anything the Italians could deploy. Before his premature removal by a short-sighted high command, Brigadier General Hobart had done much to create the nucleus of a truly effective armored force, a long line similar to those being pursued by the Germans. And in General Richard O'Connor, the British had one commander of outstanding vision and ability. In December 1940, a modest force under O'Connor successfully attacked a strong Italian position at Sidi Barani. Thus began an astonishing 500-mile drive westwards, during which 10 Italian divisions were effectively destroyed, with the capture of hundreds of tanks and guns. Fatalities, injured and missing amongst O'Connor's men, amounted in all to less than 2,000 whereas the enemy sustained losses of 100,000 dead or wounded, besides a further 130,000 men taken prisoner. Indeed, had the defeated Italians not provided their own transport and escorted themselves to the prison camps with only minimal supervision, the logistical problems of dealing with such numbers of captives would have been grave. By February 1941, O'Connor was eagerly preparing to advance on Tripoli and thereby to eliminate completely the Axis presence in North Africa. He was confident this could be achieved rapidly with the forces already under his command. He awaited only permission from above. Permission was not forthcoming. Swayed by higher political and strategic considerations, Churchill decided that one of O'Connor's valuable battle-hardened divisions should be dispatched as reinforcements to Greece. They arrive amidst a general military debacle, and shortly afterwards, a complete British evacuation of Greece was ordered. With any resumption of O'Connor's offensive ruled out, another of his experienced divisions was dispatched to Egypt. Thus, a priceless opportunity was neglected. Two further years would pass before the Axis forces were finally expelled from North Africa, and it would require much effort, much expenditure, and many dead. For meanwhile, the first units of a newly created German Africa Corps had begun landing. 
These new arrivals were already seasoned warriors, and they brought with them impressive modern weaponry. They were commanded by one of Germany's ablest and most imaginative practitioners of tank warfare, General Erwin Rommel. No longer could the Matilda dominate the fighting in the desert. The British tanks were easily outranged by the better gun German machines, which were also better armored and could travel faster and longer. Every German tank was fitted with WAGs, enabling great speed and flexibility of response in a changing battle situation. Moreover, the Germans were far ahead in the techniques and armament of anti-tank warfare. Their formidable dual-purpose 88mm gun was originally an anti-aircraft weapon. It could be employed with equal ease against tanks and became recognized as the most successful anti-tank gun of the World War. Rommel struck swiftly. Without even waiting for his full force to be assembled, he moved sharply against the inactive forward British units, throwing them back in confusion. The follow-up was immediate, and in early April, the British were compelled to evacuate Benghazi. O'Connor, hastily recalled from leave, was captured. The momentum of Rommel's brilliant offensive did not falter. Within a few months, in a spectacular reversal of fortunes, all of O'Connor's gains melted away. The Africa Corps lay siege to the port stronghold of Tobruk. In the late autumn, General Auchinleck organized a British counteroffensive in the desert. For a while, it enjoyed a measure of success. In December, Benghazi was recaptured only to fall again to the Germans in early 1942. Rommel once more began to drive eastwards. By June, Egypt itself was menaced. By this point, however, the German supply lines were uncomfortably overextended, their tank strength depleted by the heavy wear inevitable after so long and arduous an advance. Orkinlek decided to make a stand at El Alamein, where large salt marshes inland would prevent Rommel outflanking the British to the south. Throughout July, Rommel's weakened vanguard made repeated forays against the British positions round El Alamein, but each time the assailants were successfully beaten back. Even so, the British Eighth Army remained alarmingly vulnerable. Rommel, now created a field marshal following the dramatic capture of Tobruk, determined to break through the Alamein defenses and using captured fuel to thrust onwards to Cairo. It was first imperative that he pause to consolidate and replenish his forces. Although receiving only limited fresh supplies and reinforcements, by the end of August, Rommel felt ready to resume the offensive. The same period saw notable changes in the British command structure. After Stirling's service, Auchinleck was replaced as commander-in-chief by Alexander, while the forces in the field were now led by General Bernard Montgomery. Montgomery, a cautious and prudent officer, had inherited a useful outline plan designed to deny the Germans the mobility essential to the success of Blitzkrieg. The British already enjoyed an increasing superiority in the air and in numbers, though not quality, of tanks. Montgomery realized there was one vital ridge at Alam el Halfa, which Rommel must try to take. Accordingly, he prepared a defense in depth. The British code breakers were reading the enemy's signals and Rommel's supply convoys from Italy were regularly sent to the bottom. Montgomery knew, too, exactly when Rommel intended to strike. When it came, the battle for Alam el Halfa was brief. A deep belt of mines impeded the initial German assault, and when Rommel's main offensive began the following morning, the columns came under punishing British bombing attacks. Neither surprise nor speed was achieved. By the first week of September, the Africa Corps 
was back at its jumping off point. In some respects, the desert, generally flat and with few towns or natural obstructions, makes ideal terrain for tank warfare. But although a stationary tank can be well camouflaged, air cover is essential for tank formations on the move. For the clouds of sand thrown up by the tracks rapidly draw the attention of any nearby hostile aircraft. Slow-moving machines are an easy target from the air, and a single tank once hit, the high-climbing column of smoke identifies the unit's position for miles around. In desert conditions, the discomforts and dangers which tank men must normally endure are much aggravated. Insects are a perpetual torment. The heat inside the vibrating, noisy cabin becomes nigh unbearable. The engine is more likely to seize up and the turret to jam. Sand penetrates the caterpillar tracks, which then begin to grind themselves apart. The heavy, complicated machinery requires continual maintenance. And without their tank, a crew are at the mercy of the arid, unforgiving desert. In battle, the armor plating on a tank will protect the occupants from rifle and machine gun fire, from flying shrapnel, and, to a varying extent, from shell fire as well. But even the best armored tank is eventually vulnerable to fire sufficiently heavy and well-directed. For many of the tank soldiers who perished amidst the sands, death did not come easily. A tank sustaining a direct hit might simply explode, but if not, the energy of impact is converted into intense heat, resulting in a dramatic increase in temperature in the vehicle's interior. Burns and asphyxiation claimed many victims. The rivets commonly used in the construction of British tanks gave rise to an additional hazard. Here, a hit had the effect of causing the rivets to burst out of the hull, pelting the crew with fragments of red-hot metal. It was said that the screams of the dying trapped inside a blazing tank were never forgotten by those who heard it. Even when men did manage to scramble out of a crippled and burning machine, in the desert, they were frequently far away from proper medical facilities. And during engagements, water for both fit and wounded was liable to be in perilously short supply. In the weeks that followed the Battle of Alam el Halfa, a steady stream of reinforcements, munitions and supplies poured into the British camp. Montgomery was preparing to attack the German position at El Alamein, but despite Churchill's repeated urgings, he was not going to hurry. As a junior officer during the Great War, Montgomery had been appalled by the hideous, needless slaughter of the huge frontal assaults, and had resolved that men under his command would never be idly sacrificed. He would attack Rommel only when victory could be assured by overwhelming military superiority. Montgomery and Alexander fixed their offensive to begin on the night of October the 23rd, 1942. As the initial 1,000-gun artillery barrage opened up, Montgomery was confident in the knowledge that the enemy was outnumbered by 3 to 1 in men, 4 to 1 in warplanes, and 6 to 1 in tanks. Moreover, the supply situation was heavily to the Allies' advantage. Montgomery could easily and rapidly make good any losses. With the Royal Navy dominating the Mediterranean, the Germans could not. Two other factors were in the Allies' favor. The Africa Corps possessed only one-tenth the minimum prescribed fuel issue and would very soon be constricted in mobility. Secondly, there had been much disease among the Axis forces, and the general himself had fallen ill. On the first day of the battle for El Alamein, Rommel was convalescing in Austria. 
Montgomery's initial plan was for a major thrust in the north coupled with a feint to the south. The first two days were spent in probing for passages through the deep minefields and in what Montgomery called the crumbling process, a wearing down of the enemy's entrenched defenses. The German anti-tank positions proved too resilient, and the hoped-for breakthrough into the open desert in the German rear did not materialize. The adaptable Montgomery decided on a change of tactics, and on October the 28th, he launched a new drive northwards for the coast. Rommel rapidly counted, and this attack too came to grief. The defenders were exacting an appalling toll of the Allied armor, which was losing four times as many machines as the Germans. Nevertheless, the balance of numbers was all the time shifting more and more in favor of the 8th Army. Montgomery, increasingly anxious, but as determined as ever, drew up fresh plans. His third attack began early on November the 2nd, and again was met with fierce resistance. Although a third corridor was forced through the German defenses, by the end of the day, a further 200 tanks were out of action. But the 8th Army still deployed 600 operational tanks. The two armored divisions comprising the main striking arm of the Africa Corps had now dwindled to 2,000 men and some 30 tanks. On November the 3rd, Rommel began organizing a general withdrawal. Montgomery had won the Battle of El Alamein. It was now that Montgomery's instinctive caution began to work against him. The follow-up was slow and hesitant. Again and again, the combination of skill, bravery and adroit generalship enabled Rommel's tiny forces to elude their vastly superior pursuer. On November the 8th, large British and American forces began landing in northwest Africa. Not until the following May would the last Axis forces surrender, but from that moment, their eventual defeat became certain. They faced an enemy strongly established on both sides of them. Allied supply lines were secure. The United States had only just begun mobilizing its immense resources of manpower. But already, the world's strongest industrial economy was achieving formidable levels of war production. Whatever Rommel did, the enemy would always have too many tanks. The ailing Rommel launched the last of his many counterattacks on March the 6th. Shortly thereafter, he was recalled to Germany. Although Hitler was disappointed in his field marshal, he wanted him well out of the way before the ignominy of the final capitulation. After a long succession of defeats on land, in Britain, the North African victories were received with much jubilation. But in Germany, the happenings in this small, remote theater of war were far overshadowed by the Herculean struggle on the Eastern Front. The disaster of Stalingrad had left Hitler's public prestige undimmed. Indeed, Hitler's outstandingly gifted minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, had seized on the occasion to stiffen the spirits of the German people to inspire in them new frenzies of loyalty and a greater willingness to face sacrifices. The mood, shared by many of the German soldiers, was somber but confident. That March of 1943, Hitler vacillated. The German army, worn down and depleted by the long, bruising conflict, desperately needed time to consolidate and make good the severe losses in men and equipment. For a space, Hitler contemplated a purely defensive holding strategy on the Eastern Front while Germany recovered her strength. But inaction was foreign to his soul. On the 13th of March, he signed an order presented by General Zeitzler 
laying the groundwork for what would be designated Operation Citadel, a major new offensive in the east. The objective was a huge enemy salient, 120 miles wide and 80 miles long. At the base of the salient stood the little-known Soviet city of Kursk. The fighting for Kursk would embroil Hitler's armies in the greatest tank battle in history. Hitler had various reasons for embarking on this new adventure. He ardently wished to vindicate his people's confidence in their leader. That confidence, he knew, was not shared by many of his high command. Some of his generals were now seriously questioning not merely Hitler's military competence, but even his very sanity. Many more were irritated by what they saw as his constant interference. To overawe the doubters, Hitler needed a resounding triumph. And if the German army had suffered badly, intelligence reports suggested that the enemy was in far more desperate straits. One more huge thrust might finish the Red Army completely, or at least decisively eliminate it as a positive threat for some time to come. Stalingrad, too, had to be avenged. On the 15th of April, Hitler signed the secret directive ordering the attack on the huge salient. The victory at Kursk, he said, must shine like a beacon to the world. The date for Citadel was set for the 3rd of May. The plan that finally evolved was for a classic pincer movement. The 9th Army in the north striking down to meet the 4th Tank Army moving up from the south. Their junction was to be just east of Kursk itself. In the weeks that followed, Citadel was repeatedly postponed. Many of the delays were a result of persistent difficulties encountered in the production of the new German tank models. It was not Hitler alone who was anxious that the new machine should be present in strength when the offensive opened. The Germans had invaded the Soviet Union with the outstanding Mark III and Mark IV tanks as the mainstay of their armored forces. Hitler despised all the Slavic peoples as incorrigibly backward and uncivilized. And in all the bitter fighting in the East, nothing had caused greater dismay and consternation than the discovery that the derided Eastern race had developed a tank clearly superior to the best that German military technology could offer. Its wide tracks allowed the T-34 to operate on soft terrain, where the German tanks would wallow and thunder. With its angled armor, the Soviet tank could withstand extraordinary punishment. The Germans found that repeated, accurate fire from their 88mm guns was the only really effective counter. In many respects, the T-34's design was a masterpiece of simplicity. Far easier to build than its German counterparts, the Soviet tank could be produced in half the time. No less important, the T-34 was also far easier to maintain and keep operational in the field. It was imperative that Germany find an answer to the T-34 and resources sorely needed elsewhere had been diverted to a huge crash program of tank development and production. In the spring of 1943, the new German machines were at last emerging from the factories, though in disappointingly small quantities. Hitler's hopes were pinned on three main types. At 52 tons, the Tiger tank was far too heavy for most bridges, but was capable of wading through shallow streams. It was a formidable vehicle, especially it was later proved in defense. But its complex machinery was prone to frequent breakdowns and repairs and maintenance were not simple. Though none had dared mention it to Hitler, in the Panther tank, efforts had been made to copy some of the outstanding features of the T-34. It was again, in essence, a powerful machine, 
But again, mechanical oversophistication incurred the penalty of unreliability. And at Hitler's insistence, it was being rushed into production before problems with the cooling system had been satisfactorily resolved. Finally, there was the monster elephant, or Ferdinand tank. It lumbered along at only 12 miles an hour, but carried an enormous thickness of armor and mounted the unmatchable 88 millimeter gun. But the design made no provision for a machine gun to defend against infantry. And when the Ferdinand went into action, it was not long before the Soviets discovered that a courageous foot soldier could disable the Colossus with an incendiary through the air intakes. With appropriate modifications, it was possible to mount a gun directly on a standard tank hull. The resultant armored vehicle, known as a self-propelled gun, had many of the advantages of a tank and was significantly easier and cheaper to build. With both sides striving to maximize their frontline armored strength, these machines became used in increasingly large numbers. Throughout May and June, Hitler's generals did not waste the time gained from the repeated postponements of Citadel. All over Western Europe, German bases and garrisons were stripped to provide the forces amassing for the great attack. Despite the intensifying Allied bombing offensive, Germany's home air defenses were pared down to release pilots and aircraft for the east. Even though many individual divisions were below full establishment, the final number of troops assembled for Operation Citadel was impressive. Amongst them were Germany's bravest and most experienced fighting men, including a large representation from the famous Waffen-SS. The morale of the German soldiers was high. Stalingrad still weighed heavily on many minds. But at Stalingrad, it had been the Italians and Romanians who, by breaking under a Soviet assault, had opened the way to disaster. This time, there would be no unreliable allies to worry about. Hitler had decreed that Citadel was to be a 100% German affair. Confidence was further bolstered by the great quantities of modern equipment arriving daily at the front and by the new tanks. On the airfields, the Luftwaffe was concentrated in unprecedented strength. Indeed, the armaments, tanks and aircraft which Hitler was committing to this one great battle were comparable to those assembled for the entire invasion of the Soviet Union two years previously. Nevertheless, the very magnitude of the undertaking unsettled Hitler, who ordered that there be no advance public announcement concerning Citadel. He said, the thought of it makes my stomach churn, but I see no alternative. The Germans faced an enemy much changed from the ragged, pitiful battalions who had broken so quickly or surrendered so readily in the early stages of the war. Stalin's callous tyranny was still intact, but in the interests of winning the war, he had relaxed the terror and allowed a limited reawakening of national sentiment and aspirations. The unspeakable brutality of the invaders had fired a fierce determination to resist. And with the myth of Nazi invincibility shattered at Stalingrad, the Soviet peoples were now moved by well-founded hope as well as by implacable resolve. At just this time, the means for waging effective war were at last becoming available. Stalin had been forced to promote men not because they were congenial to him, but because they were efficient. As a result, Soviet production of tanks, artillery and aircraft was beginning to outperform that of Germany, both in quality and quantity. Even the Soviet rifle had a higher fire rate than the German. 
Often, Soviet technical ingenuity bore surprising fruit. In German factories, shells that failed to meet the necessary precision standards were simply discarded. In Soviet factories, there was no such wastage. Being well advanced in rocketry, they used their reject shells as missile warheads. There were few things that the German infantrymen feared or detested more than a Katyusha attack. General Zhukov, the principal Soviet commander in the field, learned quite early on that Citadel was in contemplation. In any case, Zhukov and his staff could have guessed their enemy's intentions. They knew that German generals could rarely resist the temptation to try to cut through the base of a salient and isolate its head. This time, they would find the defenders thoroughly prepared. Throughout that May and June of 1943, Zhukov's men were busy too. As a preliminary, they laid three deep belts of mines round the salient perimeter. On July the 1st, Hitler returned to the Wolf's Lair, his command post in East Prussia. There would be no more postponements. Citadel would go ahead on the 4th of June. Victory was needed, Hitler declared, in order to dispel the gloom of our allies and crush any silent hopes stirring within our subjugated people's breasts. The plans for Citadel included detailed arrangements for the transports of expected vast numbers of Soviet prisoners to forced labor camps. In the monumental battle about to be joined, the Soviets started out with some advantage of numbers. Against 900,000 German troops, Zhukov was fielding 1,400,000. Soviet superiority was most marked in respect of artillery. With 20,000 guns, they had twice as many as their adversary. The Red Army deployed 3,600 tanks, as opposed to the Germans' 2,700. And in the air, the Luftwaffe's 2,000 machines faced 2,400 Soviet machines. By July the 4th, the two great assault groupings, north and south, had been brought to full battle readiness. Already ahead of the German lines, parties of mine clearers were about their stealthy work. Slowly, imponderably, the tips of the mighty armored spearheads inched towards the flanks of the Soviet-held salient. Behind them, the armies waited. The mood was one of somber expectancy. Amongst the German ranks were many seasoned veterans. They had tasted the battle before and known its ugliness. They knew that in even the most splendid of victories, the soldier paid a price. They had seen the dead, the maimed, the wounds to be relieved only by the kindly bullet from a friend's revolver. Tomorrow, it might be one's own turn, or that of a comrade. Who could tell? The main tank offensive was scheduled to begin early on the morning of the 5th. Zhukov knew the exact timing. Ten minutes before the German columns were due to move, a large Soviet artillery barrage opened up. It was a grim presagement. The attack proceeded. The great assault groupings swung into action. The skies above filled to the roar of aero engines as the two German air fleets flew thousands of sorties.
Bearing down from the north, Kluger's 9th Army, with the armor commanded by General Model, advanced seven miles during that first day. In the south, Manstein pushed 11 miles up towards them. It was gratifying progress, but it was scarcely blitzkrieg. The Soviet minefields proved very deep. Their dug-in defenses at a formidable level of preparation. As the offensive continued, the Germans encountered increasing difficulties. They were accustomed to fighting against numerical odds, but accustomed too to having a superiority in quality, quality of men, quality of leadership, and quality of machines. They found first that the performance of their new tanks was less than had been promised. The Panthers were still plagued by mechanical breakdowns. Out of 200, only 40 remained fully operational at the end of the first day. of Stuka dive bombers had been converted to a tank killing role and at the outset enjoyed considerable success. But although hundreds of Soviet aircraft had been destroyed in the first onslaught, ample reserves were to hand and the new Soviet machines and pilots proved a match for anything the Luftwaffe could bring against them. The slow-flying Stukas were very highly vulnerable to attack by hostile fighters, and those that survived required careful shepherding. Gradually, domination of the air passed to the Soviets. By the third day, the Germans had accounted for over 450 Soviet tanks. But the enemy still possessed abundant strength in armor. What was yet more dismaying, the evidence was incontrovertible that Soviet military technology had again leapt ahead of their own. The Soviets had succeeded where the Germans had not in combining a heavy armament with a relatively light chassis. The familiar T-34 Hull now sported a huge 122mm gun, and there were reports of machines yet more awesome. The attack ground on. However slowly, the pincer arms were drawing closer together. The Germans knew that the Red Army did not lack for brave men. They had seen, many of them, Soviet formations advancing steadily and unflinchingly to certain annihilation. The bravery was still there. But no longer did it manifest itself in a readiness to submit to mass slaughter. It was seen, rather, in the handfuls of men remaining behind to defend an evacuated position, well satisfied to yield up all their lives if, by so doing, they could destroy a single German tank. In many other ways, it was palpable that the Soviet command style had undergone a radical transformation. No longer were the Germans rounding up the accustomed huge droves of prisoners, Zhukov's field commanders were mastering the art of tactical withdrawal, of the probing counterstroke, and they were luring the Germans into hideously effective tank-killing grounds. The Soviets had contrived other devices. They had developed what was called the Pack Front, a highly sophisticated tactical grouping for both offense and defense. 
The fearsome Katyusha rockets comprised its first line. Behind them were positioned batteries of heavy artillery. When these had done their work, heavy tanks moved through, bringing in their wake the infantry clinging to the sides of lighter tanks. The unvarying predictability of pack front assaults allowed the German defenders to work out countermeasures. But even so, the pack fronts inflicted terrible damage. After a week of bitter, ferocious fighting, the German armor was much weaker and Kluger even began withdrawing some units. The southern prong of the German attack was also at a virtual standstill, and many miles still separated the two pincer arms. Then, on July the 12th, Zhukov launched his own counter-offensive to the north of the salient around Oral. The preliminary maneuvering brought one unforeseen but monumental consequence. That day, 700 German tanks of the 4th Panzer Army were driving forwards near the tiny village of Prokhorova. Coming in the opposite direction by the sheerest coincidence were 850 Soviet machines of the 5th Guards Tank Army. Neither group was aware of the presence of the other until, peering through the small viewing windows of their iron cockpits, the crews on both sides were aghast to see the enemy formations in unprecedented strength advancing steadily upon them. The surrounding hills acted as a natural funnel to the streaming masses of armor. The two huge columns ran and broke upon each other. There ensued an extraordinary pitched battle of titanic proportions. Never before or since have so many tanks, over 1,500, been embroiled upon a single battleground. No strategic decision had dictated this tumultuous clash. And once it began, there was no possibility of tactical plans or even of clear, unified command. The tanks dueled and fought solely as individuals firing at point-blank range, ramming and climbing over each other, pitilessly destroying or being destroyed. One observer described himself as feeling that the landscape was too small for what was happening in it. Among the tank crews of the Red Army, it passed into legend as the Ride of Death. Above the field of conflict, Luftwaffe and Soviet warplanes circled and fought. But they could play no part in the stupendous fray beneath. Immense clouds of dust and dense billowing smoke obscured friend and foe alike. For eight hours, the frenzy of battle raged unabated. Then, gradually, the two sides disengaged and regrouped. The Red Army left 300 tanks behind them on the battlefield. The Germans had lost a similar number. The Soviets could rapidly and fairly easily replace their machines. For the Germans, it was a far harder task. The main thrust of Zhukov's counter-offensive was to the north of the Kursk salient. 
So long as the Germans held Orel, Moscow was potentially at risk. The Germans put up stern resistance. But the troops were weary after the days of hard fighting. Armament, spares and supplies were depleted. Their Red Army assailants were fresh and well armed with, behind them, secure lines of communication and no shortage of equipment or supplies. The fighting round Kursk would continue another 20 weeks. But already the second week of July, it was apparent that Citadel could not succeed. Row upon row of Soviet fortifications remained intact, some stretching up to 200 miles eastwards. To this one great operation, the Germans had committed nearly all of their entire armored strength in the east. Now it had failed and Zhukov's armies were threatening to trap what remained of the German tank divisions. At a war conference on the 13th of July, Hitler formally ordered the cancellation of Citadel. The Soviets had suffered slightly higher losses, but with their enormous reserves of manpower and with ever higher levels of military production, these could soon be made good the Germans faced graver problems. Garnering the means to fight the Battle of Kursk had put immense strains upon the army, the Luftwaffe, and on German industry. They could not afford losses on such a scale. The Soviet Union had become the anvil upon which the Nazi war machine was destined to break. The Volga now proved to have marked the utmost limit of Hitler's conquests. And after Kursk, the tide of war could flow only one way, westwards. The German soldier would display astonishing resilience in defense, and German and Soviet tanks would clash many times in the two years of bitter fighting that lay ahead. But in the minds of all the tank crews, two momentous events overshadowed everything that followed. El Alamein where the German land forces sustained their first significant defeat, and the great tank battle of Kursk, where the People's Army showed itself a match for the formidable invaders, not merely in courage, but in weaponry and battle skills as well. <laughs> 